Inclusion Solution Live, the Winters Groups podcast for all things diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am your host, Brittany J. Harris, Vice President of Learning and Innovation, and I am excited to leverage this medium as yet another opportunity to facilitate dialogue, shift perspectives, and empower action in service of equity, justice, and inclusion. This season, we are demystifying internalized oppression. Hey, hey, and welcome back to the Inclusion Solution Live. This is Brittany, and I am joined today with Travis Jones. We're going to continue the discussion on demystifying internalized oppression. And so if you've been tuned in, you know, we've been connecting with team members, uh, members of the TWG fam, and we've been unpacking some of the insights and perspectives that we shared recently on the Inclusion Solution blog, more specifically, as it relates to some of the messages and biases and norms that we've internalized around different aspects of our identity. And so today, I'm here with Travis. We are talking about whiteness and working ourselves to death. Um, Before we get into it, Travis is our principal strategist of race, religion, culture. That's his formal, that's his formal title. Um, But certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, Travis is is, is more than that. So I'm actually just going to give him the opportunity, share a little bit more about himself uh his self what, what whatever um um what he's bringing to this conversation aspects of his identity travis i'm gonna turn it over to you so that we can go ahead and jump right in. all right sounds good i will be brief like Brittany said in addition to the fancy titles that i don in the <laughs> diversity and inclusion space i do feel like i'm just a guy from north carolina um and i'm uh, claim Charlotte as home, but I really spent the majority of my life in, um, and this will come into play in our conversation today, predominantly white uh, rural communities, churches, schools, uh, about 30 minutes outside of Charlotte. And I always kind of name the South as the part of the world that's really shaped, you know, who I am uh, from cultural kinds of things like the foods that I love and the things that I, you know, find pleasure in outside of work. Um, but more than that, it has given me a perspective of the world and especially about race. Um, if you live in America, you have some perspective of race, but there's a particular perspective, I think, where I grew up uh, with. And so uh, I'm a straight, white, cisgendered uh, male. And so that shapes a lot of what I see and don't see in the world. And so, um, you know, the, the post that we're going to talk about today names whiteness, but I'm still on a journey, probably, uh, I guess, formally 10 or so years of kind of thinking really seriously about my own race. And so I like to name that when I do introductions, because it is for so long, it was an invisible part of my life that uh, shaped who I was and how I saw the world. But mm-hmm. I just increasingly want to want to name how my whiteness, you know shapes me uh in really deep ways um what else that didn't sound like it got it kind of who all i am i also love to travel i love basketball um mm-hmm. hip-hop fan i'm a new dad so mm-hmm. that's like a big part of my journey now and uh yeah i'm looking forward to the conversation cool cool um so so I'll be honest, Travis. Like, so when we when we came up and decided to um, really unpack internalized oppression, definitely knew you wanted to be part of. I mean, definitely knew we wanted to have your perspective on it. Um, definitely, we, we knew you wanted to contribute. But I honestly had no idea how you were going to approach writing this post, um, particularly because when we think about you know demystifying internalized oppression, we go straight to the ways in which our like, you know, subordinated group identities, you know, internalized messages, right? You just named um, some of those identities that influence who you are, how you show up, most of which, or all of which experience a certain degree of power, um, a certain degree of privilege. And so 
for the folks who didn't read the death how did you coach um contribute into the series what did you talk about and uh you know what was the point what were you trying to get across uh um, with this perspective yeah so the post is whiteness and working ourselves to death and <clears throat> in some ways the post was reactionary in the sense that I had like bumped up against a couple of tweets of this founder of the sports blog Barstool who uh, basically had gone viral for uh, you know criticizing the role of unions there was I guess rumors of his staff forming a union he since had kind of said he was just being playful but he called his own workers basically the the p word unions are for uh P words, um, trying to keep it PG here, which essentially is, you know, a real intentional use of this kind of feminizing workers that would want to join together mm-hmm. to, you know, for solidarity of their own rights, you know, as workers. And so, uh, you know, this is not my area of research, but I guess there's been lots of folks who have criticized this part of masculinity that clings to this idea of we are the real hard workers in the world. Um, and that idea of like masculinity as being the real workers is, you know, really intimately tied with whiteness. In fact, the way that whiteness first came about in America was poor and working class whites basically mm-hmm. traded in many of them, their ethnic history, Irish, Italian, Scots, etc., cetera, uh, and erased even to the point of like losing their accents, losing their languages, losing their religious traditions, et cetera for this uh, to be above their black and brown neighbors, which at the time were either, you know, enslaved peoples from West Africa or other, you know, immigrant groups that were exploited labor. Um, And so it didn't buy them much, but it it definitely is, you know, it's what one scholar calls the wages of whiteness. And so basically it's like, I'll kind of sell this part of myself so that I could be part of this real American, the real workers, Mm -hmm. not like those, you know, uh, enslaved people or, you know, indentured servants or something. Um, So anyway, I just kind of took that headline and ran with it. Um, And so the point of the post, I guess the main theme is that this ideology. And so again, uh, for me, an ideology is not something that someone necessarily consciously believes or that they can put their finger on, but this deep seated maybe to some degree unconscious, this really embodied idea that the white working class are the real workers um, acts as a blinder to solidarity with other kinds of workers that are, you know, not white workers Mm -hmm. of color. Um, And so, you know, one of the things I'll I'll kind of stop here and see what follow up questions you have, but one of the, the resources that I mentioned in this post, I would highly recommend anybody who's listening to check this out is a new book just came out, I believe last year, sociologist, Jonathan Metzl wrote a book called dying of whiteness. And he shows empirically drawing on all kinds of medical research that the white working class in rural parts of America um, are literally dying at rates much higher Mm -hmm. um, than they ever have in like recent decades. So things like um, suicide uh, from lack of medical care, you know, uh, falling, failing schools, all those kinds of things. Um, So a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the argument of his book basically is that this is because of this ideology right so rejecting any kinds of politicians or movements that would be fighting for better health care, um, rejecting and fighting against any kind of movements that would be for some kind of gun control or gun reform um, and those kinds of things. And so that's the, the point of the post of working ourselves to death. And, you know, I, I end the post by saying working class, poor white folks really need to wrestle with this. Um, and I think things get really complicated because, you know, I in an ideal world, we'd love solidarity for, you know, empathy across uh, racial differences. And I think part of this book is saying, you know, if you can't get down or, you you know, you're not a place in your life where you can, like, really be passionate about, you know, criminal justice reform or Black Lives Matter, you know, could you at least pay attention to your own racial group 
really suffering under this ideology that you think is saving you or that gives you some sense of power or some sense of identity. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. That's kind of what I was. And I want to, and, and I want to come, I want to come back to this, this whole notion of, you know, how these norms, um, can be an inherent detriment and in, in, in folks, white people not even realize it. But before we get into that, I think it's worth pausing just for um, people perhaps entering the conversation who, you know, heard you say whiteness, masculinity, and like, whoa, like, what does that even, even mean? And so from your perspective, and when you talk about or call out whiteness, when you name masculinity, how are you defining those? What is that? What, what do they actually, what do, what do these terms actually mean to mm -hmm. you? So for me, you know, I think there's some people that would look at whiteness like economically. So what are white groups of white people as a whole, as a collective, you know, buying? Where are they spending their money? Where are they investing? What kinds of resources do they have? Um, I could, you know, there's criminal justice scholars that, you know, would look at how are white people voting when it comes to like policing and prisons, things like that. My own lens on whiteness is, <clears throat> like I said, as a cultural ideology, that there are all kinds of beliefs and values um, that aren't necessarily true for every single individual white person, if you have white skin. But whiteness is something that, you know, uh, is a set of deep beliefs and values really created for white people, but anybody can ingest and absorb and be affected by the ideology of whiteness. Um, you know, and my, and so for me, uh, whiteness starts way back, you know, almost Christopher Columbus. And then with the slave trade, I mean, very simply, it's the ideology that white people are the more intelligent, the more valuable, the more pure, superior race and then that shows up in policies the way schools are structured the way you know the real estate market is structured you know how are who's portrayed in movies and in children's books uh in this country it is kind of everywhere and when you start kind of waking up to see how racial differences show up in everyday life um i have no problem saying we live in a white supremacist culture there's, you know, very clear evidence we can point to um, in almost every direction. So for me, whiteness is simply that. It's the ideology that one group of people, white people, is superior than, than others. And then masculinity in the, in the similar sense, um, I'm not talking about biological sex here, but this kind of cultural beliefs and values tied to this idea of what real manhood or what real men are about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, it's probably beyond our kind of short conversation today about it. are there good masculinities and different masculinities and all that. But for me, I guess I typically when I think about, you know, talking about masculinity as a culture, I'm thinking about its most toxic forms, um, you know, similar to whiteness, that men are a dominant group when it comes to gender, cis, straight men. Um, and so same way that shows up in our movies, our policies, our institutions. It's, you know, who runs the majority of the companies and the political kind of power in this country are straight white men. Um, and for me in particular, I told you kind of a little bit about where I grew up. I mean, whiteness and masculinity took on different flavors than they might, you know, in the Northeast or the West Coast or something. But for me, you know, um, being a working class man myself, I was really steeped in this culture that, you know, uh, this competitive spirit that men should be hard workers, um, even to the cost of their health. And in fact, the cultures I grew up in, it was kind of a badge of honor to brag about how many hours you worked. Um, and of course, tied into that is like real work is blue collar work, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps not needing any help of anybody else, let alone unionizing the help of your colleagues to make sure everybody's got wages and health care and safe working conditions. Um, it's a, a really individualistic look at work as this thing that, you know, we do as individuals and we don't need any help from anybody else. So, um, so the reason why I think this is, is so important, 
just just to just we yeah, get sure for purposes of expanding our lexicon but just thinking about how our identities how norms or what we've learned about um identity show up in the uh show up in our world is a lot of this stuff is so subtle and so so even whiteness although it's whiteness white supremacy although i've i've, I've tracked it's becoming more um you know folks are talking about whiteness white fragility much more in our space mm -hmm. now um i would still say that a lot of times even you know when when i think about the word like white supremacy i go straight to the ways in which perhaps it manifests more like overtly mm -hmm. right um like whoa like you know white supremacy you're thinking like clan maybe even like Make America Great Again, Cap, what mm -hmm. have you. Um, but then there are also just very like subtle, normalized ways that the ideology, as you would say, of whiteness uh, manifests. And so I was reading this article a couple days ago, um, and it was just picking out different norms or naming different norms that are very common in work environments that are extensions of or pillars of whiteness. And so you, you, say, you mentioned individualism. Mm -hmm. Um, which is so common and normal, go figure, normalized that I don't know that one ever goes to whiteness when thinking about the ways in which or, or why it mm -hmm. is. Another one they called out was this notion of um, sort of meritocracy, which we hear mm -hmm. often, right? Just in workplaces. Uh, and so I think it's huge to just be able to think critically about these things that are seemingly just as they are, how they've been, where they come mm -hmm. from. And furthermore, just being able to name it, like that's a big part, um, a big part of the work. And I think even a difficult part, because again, we're so connected to these things because there is there. Well, what's wrong with pulling yourself up by your mm -hmm. bootstrap? Or what's wrong with cultivating it, or at least espousing to a, a culture of meritocracy? Mm -hmm. um, you know, all these things. And if we're not peeling back or even thinking critically about how it sort of others, other groups, um we missed the mark anyway that that's what came up to me came up for me as you were describing these as ideologies mm. right which even um naming it an ideology honors the fact that hey it's so deeply entrenched mm -hmm. and like none of us are immune right none of us even the individuals who feel as though embodying you know these identities mm. In, in some form or fashion makes them or positions them as, as yeah. better, right? Or yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the next way. I mean, for whatever my, you know, perspective is worth. I mean, I think that's the next wave of like anti-racism work in America because we've spent, I mean, this is my own kind of theory. We've spent since the civil rights by we white people have spent since the civil rights building up this entire culture of goodness, around being non-racist. And so, you know, whether it's because it was just very blatant that there was those bad white supremacists, the KKK, the kids throwing, you know, rocks and uh, at students integrating schools and church bombings, all the like violent images that we saw in the civil rights, our reaction to that as white people has been to say, I'm not like those white supremacists. And so that's where we've gotten like this culture of being colorblind um and and i think you know the to move beyond that we we have to use like strong language i think like white supremacy instead of maybe just racism um i'm mm -hmm. thinking about i've been trying to find this uh, book or interview but you know there's an interview where bell hooks um you know, famous feminist critical scholar of race says i'm moving away from using racism to talk about um, this phenomenon and using white supremacy because, mm. because racism is so easy to slip out and point at some other and white supremacy gives us some language to say this is everywhere. And like you said, it shows up in, in even small ways um, in subtle ways, every, every day kinds of ways. I was going to share this brief example. You know, I work in this consulting space. I work for and with um, really senior veteran black women like Mary Frances winners and other colleagues. And it's white supremacy when I, you know, walk in, when we both walk into a room and someone assumes, you know, I might be the leader of the team and not her. Right. 
or if we're, we're out to eat, you know, and someone might assume, you know, that I'm the maybe breadwinner and hands me the check or something. Um, or the way that people's body language and, and who they give their attention to might differ, right? Um, and, and you said something, you know, and I'll be honest here, what you said about meritocracy, I really struggle with. You know, I, I just had my, my first child. I was steeped in all kinds of parenting about be the hardest worker, um, you know, don't ever let anybody outwork you. And, and of course, I want my child to, to be a hard worker, right? And try and, you know, get up when you fall and, you know, learn the value of like, you know, discipline and dedicating to stuff. Um, but, you know, one of the things that white, whiteness has done is kind of stolen the value of, you know, hard work and used mm-hmm. that against other workers, so I guess my issue is not necessarily with meritocracy per se, but it's, I mean, yeah, I do have an issue with meritocracy. I'm, I'm moving away from that language because it has been co-opted mm, as, a weapon, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, as a weapon to say, we're the real workers who work hard and mm-hmm. those immigrants or, um, you know, th- those uh, black workers or people of color, you know, they're mooching off the system or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I am where I am because of what I've mm-hmm. done and certainly um, you can too because this system is meant to operate fairly and all exactly. and it even connects back to this goodness mm-hmm. right to some extent you know even even uh, buying into sort of this this myth we can call it a meritocracy um it preserves goodness, right? Because certainly I'm good, right? I would assume, right? That there's, I'm good. And that's, that's all there is that would justify um, me being where I am and others, others not. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really profound because think about in American culture. I mean, I don't know these updated stats now, but at one point, you know, second to Japan, we're the hardest working, most working culture in the world. Um, So we work the most hours and when we're at work, we do the most stuff um, compared to any other culture. So you think about how much work and being a a worker. Yeah. You know, ties into American. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. There was something that, you know, I I put this in my post, too. I would want if (laughs) if there's white working class folks listening to this now, I would pay attention to who, you know, who is selling us that this goodness of just being a worker is your primary identity. Because the more I've experienced some class, you know, mobility myself, or I've navigated different spaces, being in grad school and kind of corporate professional environments, there's a lot of entrepreneurs now that are trying to get out of work. Um, Tim Ferriss, I think his name has this famous book, The 4-Hour Work Week, and it's this mantra that overworking is not good. And I just think, you know, there are liberal upper class white people that have a different set of values. And for them, it's getting people to work for them. You know, mm-hmm. So I would kind of encourage people to think about, I mean, are wealthy whites more or less happy when poor working class whites embrace this good worker identity because it means less work for them, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, which gets me, so I want to go back to the point you made about, I think it was Metzl's book you, you mentioned, um, mm-hmm around how internalized is internalizing these norms end up being a detriment to white people in and of itself and there's this quote you called out i'm looking for it in the post because i was like okay is he like channeling like malcolm x with this (laughs) (laughs) but you say you say the great trade-off between loving and fighting for yourself and others for the sense that you are strong and resilient in the face of challenges is and i quote coming home to roost for white men and they're taking it out on everyone else. Um, and so the, the coming home to roost, like, I, I'll be honest, I, I chuckled because I had recently, I think I was watching, this is a sidebar, y'all, but I was watching the, um, the Godfather of Harlem, which is a bomb series. And um, uh, Michael Max, so the character playing him, makes, makes a cameo. And he uses the coming home to roost analogy after um president kennedy is assassinated and his whole point was though it was misinterpreted by like media outlets at the time was that the same hate that america was perpetuating 
um, on in, in black communities was going to be the detriment of them and hey, you know, this or that, right? And so obviously, during that time, like, the media took it and ran with it and then there was this whole like smear campaign he was silenced by the patient. Like, mm-hmm. Anyway, but but I thought that was compelling, Travis. So I want to kind of get your thoughts and, and, you know, we got some resistance to this post. Yeah. Right? I want to get your thoughts on like what that means or what you meant by that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say this argument here is like in a particular tradition that has tried to... S- to name whiteness as harmful to white people too. And for me, that starts like way back with, you know, W.B. Du Bois, who called this ideology. I mean, he was writing right during, I believe, like Reconstruction, um, when poor whites were like, uh, you know, building up this identity of the real, you know, white workers. And, And Du Bois called this the great loophole. I mean, he thought that kind of this capitalist system of exploitation at the at the top would dismantle itself, except he said, except for this loophole, that if there was always a group of white working class or poor workers, you know, willing to throw black and brown neighbors under the bus, um, that, you know, that would be the loophole that maintains this system. And, you know, I think ever since then, folks like Baldwin and King and, you know, Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer and, and all these kind of radical racial justice voices, you know, have been calling for like a, a multiracial coalition of working class people to see how much, you know, they have in common in addition to their very real differences. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, Baldwin talked about like white supremacy and whiteness as this kind of, you know, disease, but but then he'd also talk about like, white and black Americans as true brothers and sisters and that we're in this thing called America together. And I think some people were even critical of Baldwin as being too empathetic towards white people, um, kind of giving them too much credit in terms of saying like they're being damaged by these things too. And that's what what was ironic about the pushback from this post. I mean, I kind of see my post as in some ways, a, you know, a love letter to white people. It might be tough love, but you know, if I, it'd be one thing to kind of write off white people that all white people are waking up and just consciously, proactively doing what they can to maintain white supremacy. And I, I think it's, it's more complicated than that. It's more, you know, like the way these ideologies work. I mean, some, the most powerful thing I think white people can do to keep white supremacy going is just not do or say anything different than what's been done in generations past. Um, And so, yeah, so Malcolm X, you know, King, any of these folks that have looked at whiteness and said, this is bad for you, too. um, That is like really compelling to me. And I I realize, you know, some folks, rightly so, probably don't have a lot of room in their toolkit for this tool of talking about whiteness because they're on the receiving end of like, you know, these systems. Right. Or even interpersonally right not you know a life experience of feeling discrimination and bias towards actual white people or living under the outcomes of white supremacist systems so as a white person I, I i really feel like it's my responsibility to talk with white people and not you know um kind of totally uh i don't know abandon or neglect kind of that work So um, I want to personalize this uh, a bit more, um, especially for the folks and hearing you so like eloquently, like unpack these terms and, you know, discuss uh, these in theory and then also, you know, very practically the ways they show up in our world. But I wonder if you'd be willing to share a little bit more just about your personal journey mm-hmm around just working through your own whiteness, masculine, masculinity. I'm, I'm even interested when you just throw in your identity as a dad, right? Mm-hmm. I have shared with people before that motherhood, you know, certainly I've been engaged in this work um, before becoming a mom. Um, but I'd certainly say just the identity of, you know, being a black mother, but then move over to a um, black boy has kind of just even shifted my perspective 
um, to a certain extent, even my level of, uh, I guess, urgency mm-hmm. even around this work. And so I wonder if you mind sharing just a little bit more about your personal journey and the ways in which perhaps this new identity kind of like influences how you make sense of it yeah. um, personally. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Because if I had one, you know, as I went back and read this post, there was lots of lines that I would change. And that's probably always going to be the case. Anytime I write something, you could critique it endlessly. And this is one post, you know, um, but one critique I would have of my own post is that it wasn't very personal or vulnerable to your point. And my other colleagues, I, I read some of their posts demystifying internalized oppression, and they really took the internalized seriously. There's a little bit of me in this post, but for the most part, I sound like a sociologist, right, which is kind of my comfort zone. And I would just highlight something I'm trying to work on or, or be thinking about is that another way for white people to avoid doing like whiteness work is by intellectualizing. So, you know, you mm-hmm. mentioned I I read all the time. So I've got all the fancy words to name these things in my pocket. But that can be a very different thing than living aware of my whiteness and how I might be, you know, intentionally or unintentionally um, hurting other people. And so, yeah, so I think even this post, if I was to be self-critical, is maybe a reflection of that. Um, I would just say personally that I could point to very real parts of my life where I bought into this idea and it wouldn't have had any of the fancy language that, you know, uh, I was a real worker and that working hard and working better and tied in with this competitiveness, this individualism and meritocracy was so much of what I was kind of taught in the world. Um, and, and even this lack of vulnerability in this post and even kind of who I am as a person and professional is not my strong suit, kind of emotional uh, intelligence work and being vulnerable and mm-hmm. self-reflective and, you know, having some real experience sharing kind of deeper about who I am. All of that is really kind of opposite of what's been embedded in me. Um, you know, I was steeped in cultures that boys don't cry, you know, toughen up. Um, I never, you know, unlike parents that I see today that are really good about asking their kids kind of why, I mean, I, I grew up in pretty like, uh, you know, one way communication, like parenting styles. And so the, the men that I was around and that like shaped me, no one ever talked about like uh, apologizing and, and making mistakes Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, taking some responsibility and, and I, there was never any men who were like intellectuals or readers or poets in my circle. So, um, you know, there was a pretty small script of what you had to do and say to be a real man in the cultures that I grew up in. And that robbed me of all kinds of stuff. Um, and so those are kind of like parts of my identity that I'm still like working on or thinking about. Um, in terms of being like how my new role as a father has shaped me. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I've got lots of thoughts there. It's like still fresh, but I'm in a Mm -hmm. interracial relationship. So my uh, child is biracial. And so I am, yeah, the things that I talk about and write about and think about, I'm having to live. Like, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And we've even had some conversations about, you know, what does it look like to have parents from, you know, different cultures, different, uh, you know, races and how do you help make sense of that for you know a child that's going to grow up right with these uh kind of different identities in a world that wants to put them in in certain boxes mm-hmm. and I don't have a lot of answers for that stuff I mean I, I hope that at some point in her like life journey she you know recognizes me as a white person that calls out white supremacy and that um you know is all about like building coalitions with um, multiracial people, especially workers is kind of something I'm, I'm drawn to like labor rights and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, already, and even with my nephew, you know, before I had a a kid, I was just really like proud to sit back. I lived my entire adult life without any white adults telling me anything about whiteness and racism in America. I mean, that's kind of the code of silence in white cultures. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so I want to do what I can, whether it's through children's books and the conversations that we have in the family to break that cycle. Um, In fact, I think probably in the grand scheme of things, I mean, racial justice movements have always been, uh, you know, led by uh, black men and women, indigenous folks, uh, Latinx peoples, you know, white people have typically, if they've been there at all, been kind of in the background, played a supporting role. And so I think one of the major ways white people can try to change the culture is through parenting or friendships or family members. Mm-hmm. That's so good. I tell people often, um, you know, certainly, certainly, certainly much work to be done in these boardrooms, training rooms, but a big part of our sphere of influence when really kind of like enacting uh Uh, behaviors that support equity and justice is home Mm -hmm. like I mean some of the most problematic cultural norms Mm -hmm. right that end up influencing polls end up influencing you know buying power and in kind of where we put our money and it end up influencing uh you know media narratives start like with conversations at the dinner table and you know and and things that we entertain when we're with people who we consider like we can kind of say anything Mm -hmm. right um and and so it's interesting this is kind of not relevant but relevant I was reading this post earlier and I just found it because I felt like it was really good so at the time of recording this y'all um we are on the heels of um Kobe and Deanna Bryant um passing away and so I'm reading this post and you know a lot of people have been talking about this like girl dad, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Cole Brown really being a girl dad. And so I'm, I was reading this post on Essence by Candace Bimbo. Um, I follow her on the gram and Twitter and, and love her work. But she talks about what it means to be a girl dad. And I was thinking about it as you were just talking about your whiteness in the context of, you know, being a dad, specifically, you know, to a, a biracial daughter mm-hmm. and how even as Candace shares in her post, like, you know, understanding masculinity plays in that as well. So she says here, she says, um, some argue or some argued a girl dad just has to be a father with daughters. I disagree. Some of the best ones I know also have sons who they are raising to be better men. I consider a girl dad to be any father who is doing the work of justice, pushing past the comforts of their own masculine masculinity to learn and unlearn, to heal and help heal in ways their daughters, other girls and women directly benefit. Mm. A girl that isn't perfect, but he is trying and the fruits of his labor are ripe and visible. And so when I read that, I I thought that that was just so beautifully put, especially Mm. because I think just by nature of just girl dad trending, certainly the... um, by you know for uh, for unfortunate reasons but the fact that it's it's trending and and it's like you know the culture has picked up on it mm-hmm. um making the connections between what that means sort of just beyond like the relational context mm-hmm. what it means more broadly and how we leverage essentially even in our families our power mm-hmm. um uh powers associated with our you know social group identities but even just like p- positional power as adults right mm-hmm. uh, when you think about adults and like young children, like how we use that, mm. right? Just how we use that. And um, I think that's just, that's just as much part of the work. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that. No, you have to send that to me because mm-hmm. I love that it challenges the idea of, of dadness, right? Yeah. That, that concept. Um, because yeah, I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, it's almost like, yeah, I mean, you you and I have done sessions after the Me Too movement on on like gender and masculinity. I and I hope this is okay to say it, Greg, we're wrong, but I think we were both surprised at like how patriarchy mm-hmm. took on so many similar forms to the sessions mm-hmm. we've done on whiteness. That that goodness of men yes. saying like, yes. good no, masculinity. That, yeah. Um, and you know, I I want to deconstruct that stuff. Like I, I've told people, I have a daughter, and it's the same old script. A lot of times, it's like, oh, you're gonna have your hands full when she's, you know, at a dating mm-hmm. age, or or that like idolization of biracial children as like, you know, the most beautiful. 
um, you know, we get those comments, right? Like, oh, you guys have such a beautiful mm-hmm. kid. And I'm like, you know, would you not say that if you saw black, all, mm-hmm. black child or Latino child or whatever? Um, but yeah, and it, and it's like, you know, what is the hidden message there that mm-hmm. only talk about my three month old, that she's beautiful and that, you know, they're already imagining her as a teenager and dating and I'm going to mm-hmm. be the strict dad with the gun or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I read something the other day that kind of like, you know, challenged me. I'm going to put it into practice. It was like, how can you instill feminist values into young girls? And mm-hmm. they have like a whole list of like seven or eight. And one of them was carve out times where, where your daughter intentionally disobeys the dad just to get practice mm-hmm. telling him man, no, right? <laughs> and I'm like a disciplinarian. Oh, that's good. Yeah, but it was like, you know, I, I really want to raise a daughter that feels empowered and that doesn't feel like men have control over her, that she owes men anything, that she's her own person and that, you know, um, she's in, intelligent beyond, you know, whatever physical attraction kind of stuff. I mean, and that that one little like micro practice, I was like, that is good. Like I never mm-hmm. you know, thought about mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that challenge is like the man is the head of the household or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Um, this has been so good. Uh, <laughs> look, but it's always good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just as a wrap up. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess actually two things to wrap up. So if you had to kind of leave folks with, you know what, in you know while they sort of engage in their own work, um, self work, reflection, um, perhaps mm-hmm. they're wrestling with some of this stuff as we all are and continue mm-hmm. to do. You know, any thoughts? Um, any any takeaways that you want? to leave especially top of mind um, as people work through their own, particularly white men, right? As they work through their own journey. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Like I said, I went back through this post because we did get kind of a a backlash in some ways. And there was folks that um, were like, felt pretty strongly about it. And some of the lines in here are pretty heavy handed. I would stand behind the message. I've got one line where I say, you know, uh, until men give up their masculinity and their whiteness. And for many men, that's the only identities that they have. Um, and, you know, that's not completely fair. It, in a blog, you can't say everything right. But in part of our work, we make the case that we all have lots of uh, multiple complex identities. And so maybe you've never thought about all of yours, but everybody is from a place in the world. You might have a set of religious, spiritual beliefs, um, you know, hobbies that you're into. And so I would encourage, yeah, white working class men to the degree that that you see yourself in very narrow terms, just in terms of the work that you do or just in terms of like how manly you are to start really thinking about all the other things that you are, too, Mm -hmm. um, as a way to diffuse some of that, you know, because all of us are right and have the potential to be beautiful, complex, changing, transformative people. And I really believe that. Those are my, that's my real kind of philosophy on human nature. But, you know, when you're writing about things that you see problematic in the world, you sometimes have to use more concise language. So I'm only talking about two identities in this post, but of course we have lots of identities. Um, I think that's one thing. And then the other thing, you know, there's a paradox in this post, like working class is an oppressed, exploited group. And yet in America, this is the power of whiteness, it is used, um, you know, as a position of power. Mm. And I think the real working class, I mean, this is how, uh, you know, black and brown working class people in the quote unquote heartland get erased, right? Because working class becomes code for just white. I would say if you really care about work and economic conditions, uh, to look across kind of the people who are in this with you, um, other working class people and see if they don't have something to say about what might make this system work better because they've been at it for a a whole lot longer than we have. Um, And so I think that was how I would end it a positive message that there is something redeeming, I think, about having a working class identity or consciousness. But as long as it's not used as we're the real workers, unlike Mm -hmm. those other uh, workers. And so that would be my challenge and, and kind of a paradox I'm still thinking through. It's showing up all over our political cycle. So we all should be mm-hmm, thinking through it. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. um, this has been bomb. Absolutely. But I already knew it was going to be bomb because <laughs> every time we link up, there's 
you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. No, thanks, um, thanks for including me. So, so Travis, tell folks, um, I mean, I think you're low-key on social, so I don't even know if you want to tell people <laughs> where to find you on social, but I mean, you you have so much you have so much to offer. So if you want to share where you are on social, feel free. And if you want to, I guess, also um, plug in your TEDx, mm-hmm. that white people, they can check you out there. Mm-hmm. Um, tell the people where or how they can keep in touch. Yeah. So I am increasingly trying to keep some of my personal profiles just kind of for me, but um, (laughs) Twitter is cool. Travis L. Jones. You can follow me there. I'm not nearly as active as I used to be. Mostly retweet favorite stuff. Um, But I'm, this is one of my goals this year. I'm going to get more active on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn pretty easy. 2020 ping. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Um, But yeah, as Brittany said, I, I did a TEDx talk about white anti-racism if you want to check that out it's called bad white people you can find that on youtube um it's my idea of white people being bad and rebellious against this idea of goodness of whiteness so but this has been great thank you thank you thank you travis folks thank you for tuning in um thank you for joining us uh this season um, definitely, definitely, definitely. Don't forget to check out the reflection guide. It is on the website, winnersgroup.com. And of course, you can find us on all of the social media sites um, using the Winters Group. The Inclusion Solution Live is just one medium. It all started on the Inclusion Solution blog, and that is still a weekly newsletter. And so if you have not already, definitely, definitely, definitely go ahead and subscribe because we are having the conversations that matter. Um, We will catch you next time.